Thank you, Mr. Chair. And a pleasant morning to all. Morning. I would like to adopt the protocol that was established by the chair. And um, a few folks came in after. And so, in addition, we're happy to have with us this morning other stakeholders from the private sector. I also note my former boss while I was at Cardi, and my very good friend from Trinidad, Dr. Lillary McComey, who is here, and I think many of you know her, many of you farmers. She worked extensively with you, especially in sweet potato work. I see Kerry Dorr, one of um, Dr. Kerry Dorr, who is very instrumental in working with invasive species, monkeys in particular. And yes, we have the schools, Dr. Thomas, the AICA representative, Mr. Merchant, the minister, and all of us, um, all who invited on the program and what have you. We couldn't, the protocol would be very extensive, but please bear with me, welcome us all. Today I want to give us an overview of the main highlights. I shall not touch on everything that we did or many of the things that we repeat each year. I would rather maybe look at the more outstanding things. And I think it's fitting that when you do something like that, you also speak to your challenges and to give some idea of maybe how we can overcome those. Again, Agriculture have a multiplicity of challenges. I promise I wouldn't really be rolling out the entire slate, but there are few that I want to highlight because I think they relate to our immediate past work and what we're trying to achieve in 2019. The theme we have tagged this year Following on from last year, last year we looked at resilience as it relates to our ability to handle the global situation with agriculture, free market, tarification, and even changing weather patterns. But this year, we're talking to food security for our country. True, it's an expression banded about, but today we want to zero in in a very practical way and bring some things to our attention. First though, shall we speak about giving account of our stewardship in the past year? So let's, let's begin. I will speak to our highlights and our major challenges. And what were our highlights? We will talk a bit about the, what we often call the productive sector, meaning our meat yields and our crop output. Following that, we will speak about some work we're doing in livestock, particularly zeroing at goat breeding. I'd also like to engage your attention with uh, what we call diagnostic veterinary services through the use mainly spearheaded from our vet lab. There's a lot of groundwork that went in. I'll tell you about it and I'll give you an update on where we are. We'd also look at some work we're doing with mapping, with knowing the, the soil nutrient status of the farm areas in St. Kitts. A small amount of work went on there already, and I'll tell you about it. And finally, 
we will speak about what we're doing with the young, emerging, and upcoming generation. So let us begin. We have challenges, all challenges, feral animals, water, and market access. I've selected those three because I think they're more critical for our 2019 program. But as I wrap up, I will also make mention of some others. So now we can go right into what we said, the performance of the crop yields and meat yields. <coughs> Our total output was for 945.3 metric tons in 2018. And this is less than the year before which was 1,094.5, a shortfall of some 11%. Out of that, the livestock output in both years were essentially the same. But we had reductions in crop yield. And I will show you that graphically. OK, yes. Um, making sure that my pointer works from here. This, this graph is about the, the meat yield. Right to the far right here, you see um, in red, it's 2018, the blue is 2017. And you, you could see that the graphs are, the, the, the bar chart is essentially the same height. So in both years, the performance was just about the same. The, the things which improved were mostly right here. <coughs> there was some increase we had in beef, slight increases, and perhaps the most noticeable was in this one, chicken. We have a small but growing broiler industry. And the other thing I'd like to point out to you, one which we're focusing on, is the goat meat, right here. There's a slight increase, but the overall quantities are very small. But goat meat is highly preferred over imports, which are much fatter. And that is why we want to work on a program to stimulate greater output in this area. We continue to, to struggle with pork. We continue to struggle with pork output, um, partly because of prices. We haven't been very price competitive, and we need to try and address that. So very briefly, this is what happened in meat yield. I now seek to draw your attention to our crop output. Again, we begin by the largest graph. We saw, now the colors are reversed now. 2018 is in blue. And here, we notice that we had increases in crops like watermelon. Clearly, our largest increase was th th this other one, cabbages. And there were also increases in tomato. Cabbages, we continue to benefit from the work that FAO started some three years ago at the Farmer Field School, where the emphasis is placed on integrated pest management, understanding the ecology, and not just reliance on pesticides. In some cases, we've been able to increase our yield by some 225%. But we, I think it's ideal if we continue this approach in other crop areas. Carrots. 
We had reductions and we believe that is mostly due to the seed quality where a lot of the seeds did not germinate, either the seed quality or the soil temperature. Again, we, it has been said that there has been increases in, soil, in ambient and soil temperatures and perhaps because of the small nature of the seeds, they were impacted. The difference in onion, um, the, the acreages in onion production continues to fluctuate and we did not do as well this time. Pumpkin and sweet potatoes are surprising in that they are traditional hardy crops which do well even with less rainfall. We believe that some of the difficulties here had to do with monkey damage and in the case of sweet potato, two things. One, we are constantly getting weevil damage and secondly, we have a situation now where a lot of the potatoes, when you plant them, they don't bear anything. They're not tuberizing. And we believe that has something to do with the change in climate, the change in microclimate. It is something that we've asked in the past, we've asked Cardi to assist us with um, sort of like doing an experiment to give some information on that. Okay, so in a nutshell, this speaks to what has happened with crop, or crop yields and meat yields. We did not put up all of the crops, but um, I, we tried to focus on the, the major ones that, especially in relation to our plans going forward. We just put up some images here of our carrots, peppers, some, some of the, the local produce that I just mentioned. We're going to move to the other slide where I will tell you a bit about the development of the small ruminant or the goat sector. As I said earlier, Goat meat has one of, is one of the things that has been targeted for increased yields. And in 2019, we want to intensify a program which we started last year. What we did last year is that with the assistance from Ross University, we first tried artificial insemination, getting semen, purchasing semen from overseas, and inseminating female goats. The success rate was very low, and so we decided that we will use um, male sires instead. And so with assistance from Ross, we brought in three males and housed them at Bayfords. Eventually, we also brought in three females. So we had three purebred males and three purebred females. The reason for this, we want to increase the weight at slaughter. Most of the animals now, after a long time, you probably get 25 pounds at best from the female. But in truth and in fact, they can give us a lot more, maybe like up to 55 pounds. And that was proven with some work that we did with the, um, the, 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 the CARICOM nutrition project. So that's the idea, we use these superior males. The other reason is to reduce in breeding. <coughs> we only have a few males, and once you constantly breed the males to the females, a farmer might have one or two stud males, and therefore the male end up serving his daughter, his cousin, and that's in breeding, I, I think you know that, and you usually have deleterious effects. So we want to reduce in breeding by introducing new stock and have a local herd that, as we said, superior meaning given like 55 pounds. So we brought in these animals. And if we go to the next slide. So we, we have these animals. And what we say to the farmers is that once you have animals, goats of course, the program is open to you, but we have to follow a particular protocol, meaning 
that the animals have to be examined by the staff. It's a combined staff of Ross and the department. Sometimes these animals have to be dewormed. You have to make sure that they're sturdy, they're up to the right weight, and also that you don't have your male running with them because the male will, be able, will sire them before we get the chance to expose them to our males. So we started the program. We <coughs> had worked with over like maybe 100 females, <coughs> but we had only found seven of them that were not pregnant and were ready for the program. And so these seven, they, they, were, they were exposed to, the, to our males. Um, for whatever reason, <coughs> sorry, for whatever reason, um, we were not successful in getting any of those seven to be pregnant. These are trial experiments, and we will continue. But the aim that we have, as you see here, is so that we can try to increase the numbers. Using these two males, we should be able, once we get the program working properly, we should be able to breed maybe at least 100, 150 females in the year. The program in 2018 had to be halted, however. We had to stop engaging the farmers on a regular basis because two of the animals got sick. They got sick, they were found to have a high worm burden, and this is because in mixing with our local stock, they picked up worms. Um, the, the local animals, you know, they had it, they wouldn't even show the worm infestation, but because these were from a different environment, the worms debilitated them terribly, and they were very sick. In fact, we lost two of them, and we had to, as it were, put them in, in a kind of under hospital kind of care and brought them back on track. They are essentially, the males are essentially back on track and ready to serve again so that anytime now, Ross and our team will be going, coming back to you, the farmer, to restart the program following the protocol. And we hope that when we come to you, that you'll be on board and that you will assist so that we could have a new stock of animals. There is a bright light though, because we have in our care two males and two females, and we allow them to interbreed as it were. And one of the females so far is pregnant. One of the two females is pregnant. <laughs> in fact, I use this opportunity now to apologize for the absence of my livestock program leader, Dr. Challenger. She is right now tending to those goats because she just made a, went to check on them this morning before she came here because the female was expecting. And in fact, I greet you with the news that she in fact delivered this morning. So <coughs> we have our first purebred boar goat born on the day that we have review and planning. Okay, so it's easy to remember her birth date. Now, the downside is that you have two young kids, right, um, Dr. Henry? Two young kids. One was a stillbirth, and so she's tending to the other one to ensure that everything is all right. So she will be late for the presentation this month. Well, she'll be late, she'll be coming after. But the two males, they're rearing and ready to go. And we hope that the farmers are equally excited and that they will join in the program and let us increase our numbers. Let's move on. The veterinary diagnostic services. I'll, I'll read from the, from the thing. <clears throat> the Federation, St. Kitts and Nevis, we receive over one million travelers annually. And we purchase quite a lot of our food on the global market. 
I, I see we have here 75%. But there are some sources that, depending on how you classify, and the more you look at value added, sometimes it go up to as high as 90% of our total food. And this perhaps might have been making major reference to meats. We are therefore vulnerable to the introduction of diseases. And this situation is further compounded by open trade and free trade. So we have need to build resilience and to strengthen our diagnostic capacities in relation to agricultural health and food safety. We have invested in livestock, as I told you, in, for example, in pigs and now in, in goats. We have plans for sheep shortly. But animal diseases and parasites in particular, that would retard our efforts and again, it will be difficult for us to take decisions about what we allow into the country or what we export if we cannot test and if we cannot declare scientifically what diseases we have or what we're trying to prevent. And we had that problem when we had our issues with meat from Brazil. When we, all of the information about the meat being tainted and beef being contaminated, we actually had to send our samples to Barbados to have them tested because we did not have such a facility. Now we're aiming to build one. The one that we're building, as I will show you on the next slide, is a level two facility. <coughs> level one is, I would put it to like most of the labs that we are accustomed to that we have here right now. Um, but a level two is one where we can test contaminants in meats and in food. And this is not a repetition of what we do in the multipurpose lab. The multipurpose lab looks mostly at food. This laboratory could test things like blood samples, fecal samples, saliva, meats, and so on. And we're looking for diseases that would affect the meat, or diseases that could even be passed on to human beings. Maybe, hopefully, over time, we might be able to move up to level three. And I think, well, level four is really those very highly sophisticated labs where, that handle things like very new emerging diseases, Ebola and so on. I don't think we'll really get there. But anything between level two and three is extremely desirable. And of course, the other thing is to have the lab accredited, meaning that the accreditation, as you see at the bottom, is ISO 1705. And that's the accreditation used by laboratories to indicate their competence, their impartiality, and their consistency. So that once we declare something, it will be accepted globally because it will be at the same standard as any level two lab anywhere in the world. What, where we are at right now, we have secured the, the money, some close to $2 million, and the facility is under construction at the Department of Agriculture. As we speak, it started late last year. We're continuing, and we're also going to be training staff locally at the Ross University, and the, we also need to acquire the equipment. This work is being guided by experts in the region who have built level two facilities before, 
so that we're trying to ensure that what we do is sound and that we have a facility that can test meats that come in and we can make a certified declaration on them or even the, what we produce and so that there'll be no question as to the quality or the integrity of what we are producing. If we speak now to the work we're doing with the soil fertility mapping and what we did in 2018, <clears throat> this is a project that we're doing, the Federation is doing jointly with the Kingdom of Morocco. We did something similar with the Republic of China on Taiwan, but they, they mostly looked at cropping areas. But this project is more comprehensive. It covers the whole of St. Kitts and the whole of Nevis. The, the, the countries are divided into grids, a total of 400 grids, and soil sample will be taken from each of them. So far, we've done about 200 of the grids, 50 in Nevis, 150 in St. Kitts. And the soil will be taken to the multipurpose lab or to the Bureau of Standards for testing. And we're looking at the normal nutrient status, the major nutrients, the macronutrients, the, the, the micronutrients. We're also looking at the physical qualities, texture, electrical conductivity, all the things that affect growth and development so that we will know exactly the nutrients and what are the best place as it relates to a particular crop. And we're sincerely grateful for this assistance from the Kingdom of Morocco. And this year, 2019, we will continue that work as well. Of course, in the end, the information will be available online and especially to decision makers so that we'll be better informed as to what we're doing. In 2018, we went into a new approach. Normally, our work is with our farmers, and we just give marginal support to schools because the schools have an agricultural program. But we recognize that we need to do more. For example, when we look at the profile of our present farmers, research has shown that the, the average age of the farmer, on average of course, is a mature person 50 years and over. That in itself says something. It's always known that that age category are low risk takers and they adopt new technology much more slowly. And that is evident in more ways than one. For example, it's a long time that we've been pushing protected agriculture, but the level of adaptation is very low. And it has to do with it is normal that at that age category, one is more resistant. People stay with what they know. The other thing is that our investment and our cash options are very, very limited. And there is a lot demanded of agriculture. There's a lot required from agriculture. And if agriculture is going to deliver national goals, what do I mean by that? People say, well, we need to feed ourselves. We need to have more. Then if we're going to do that, several things need to change. One of which has to do with the investments in agriculture. Another has to do with government's own outlook and its backing for agriculture. And another one has to do with the practitioners in agriculture. And so we seek to influence all those spheres. And in this case, we believe we need to engage our young, bright minds because they're the ones who are going to adopt the new technology and hopefully if we, if we train them from early, 
We can also make them bankable and so that they will also be able to attract investments. So we've gone into the schools. I want to give special credit and I would like you to applaud, please, Mr. Stuart Vorsels, who has been instrumental in creating a work program for the students and also very instrumental in carrying the program to the primary schools, both in St. Kitts and Nevis. I think he deserves a round of applause. We in St. Kitts, we are already teaching in four primary schools. We're teaching eight, some 800 students and continuing. And we're not doing it as a hobby. We want to work it into the program such that it will be subject for examination. It will be part of the regular curriculum and not about talking but really practical so that they can be meaningful, they can go into farming as they grow up and bring the kind of change and development that we require. I'm going to hasten on because I've used up much of my time. Now, let me engage you about the challenges, please. And I will try to also make some suggestions. And I think I can do that in a few minutes. So we, we men I mentioned the challenges to you before. I shall discuss the first one, feral animals. Now monkeys and wild pigs is a persistent problem. One of the things I want to plant in our minds this morning, yes, I agree with you to call the Department of Agriculture and ask what we're doing about monkeys. I think you should also call the Ministry of Environment. I think you're giving them an easy time. You're taking them off the hook. Monkeys come into our farms. But where do they live? Where do they belong? They live mostly in the natural environment, in the guts, in the forest which is a factor of the environmental sustainable development. I think just like us, they have a responsibility to seek to manage. Let us broaden the debate. As we, as we talk about what's happening, we also need to engage them. Nonetheless, we continue to, to, to do our part in trying to manage these animals. So we find that as I will show you here, that we had not collected any data in the past. So I can't tell you exactly as um, how much damage we have or how much crop loss has taken place because of pigs and monkeys. But that is something that we need to do, and that is something that we're going to be doing this year. Because the number of animals have intensified, the amount of damage have intensified, and I believe that is one of the factors too that is affecting our overall yields. So we need to do that. But in addition to that, we have a program which is a Jeff FAO sponsored program which looks at invasive species and in particular monkeys and how they're impacting uh, how they're impacting us we mostly focus on how they're impacting crops how they destroy the watermelons how they eat the pumpkins and so on but listen they're also destroying the natural environment there are certain birds that the numbers have gone down because monkeys are eating the eggs and the young. There are certain plants, certain bromeliads that you cannot find as easily in the forest because monkeys are eating them and they're, as it were, destroying the numbers because there are too many. Trees like breadfruit and breadnut, those kind of trees in the forest, 
The monkeys are killing them because they're stripping them. And so it's not just agriculture that they're damaging. So this study is going to look overall as to the impacts that they're having. But of course, with all of that, we cannot address our problems if we don't call. We have to bring down the numbers. There are more than we can, whether it's 100,000 or 40,000, we may not be exactly certain. What we're certain of is that there are more than we could handle. And we need to bring the numbers down. So we will continue our ways of um, trapping and culling so that when we produce something, it can actually reach on our plate, it can reach on the table. Let, let's hasten on and let me speak to water availability. <coughs> Agriculture in St. Kitts is entirely, almost entirely rain fed. <laughs> we are one of the countries where protected agriculture do not form a significant part of our output. <clears throat> For one, we have not tried to disaggregate the data and put protected agriculture by itself. And I think that is something that we should begin to do. But I know it's going to be small because we only have a small number of greenhouse, if you call them, and one or two hydroponic systems so that the output as a part of the total output will be small. But once we're going to go into open field agriculture, as we do, then rainfall becomes critical. And since the, the rain pattern is changing, we need to look elsewhere for other sources of water. Um, for example, if we're going to look at, if we can go back to the, the, this slide again, if we can look at how we can do things a little different, we can perhaps do more item C, more intensive farming. Instead of planting so wide, we can space our crops more closely. We can also do intercropping. If we look at irrigated farms, that's an option. We, we do not have a lot of irrigated farms or irrigated acreages. And when it's not raining, we would need irrigation. And of course, as I just said, we need to consider protected agriculture. It is a greater investment, a startup investment, but the yields are greater. Now I'll show you the other slide, which speaks about, well, getting to the problem itself, water availability. We therefore, because of the change in weather patterns, we need, as farmers, we need to consider water harvesting. Well, we've done that with the dams, and there are other means, there are other methods. There are also old reservoirs from in this SSMC times, reservoirs, wells, springs, and some of these still yield water. And as farmers and as a government, these are some things that one need to consider. There's also the government supply. Overall though, if we're going to be addressing the water issues in agriculture, I think we really need government to have a water policy. All of these different sources of water and the different qualities of the water, there need to be a national approach as to which quality of water will go, for example, to the cruise ships, which quality will go to irrigating a golf course, which quality will go to drinking and to agriculture. It is very necessary and I think government should consider something that speaks to all of the different sources and find a way to apportion water to the different sectors, including agriculture. Let me move on from that and show you the last slide, um, as I must be minded of the time, <coughs> market access. A lot of <coughs> times, farmers as, have a challenge. <coughs> we don't produce more because we can't sell more. 
even in the local market. You go to the supermarkets and so on to sell them stuff, they have already imported things. And regardless to how we persuade, nothing changes. I'm just going to give you a brief introduction and then I'll take my seat. We, well, the question is, how do we deal with that? You try persuasion. I don't think we, are, we have been very successful. Farmers often ask, they say, well, you know, remember I used to ban things. Well, why you can't ban things, Mr. Director? Why you saw everybody? Why you can't ban the things? The truth is, we've gone past the era when we could ban and we could give quotas. <coughs> but here, what we can do, we're members of the WTO. We're members of the WTO since, I think it's 1996. The trade people will correct me there. <coughs> The WTO, the World Trade Organization, <coughs> they have this system where they allow you as a member, you negotiate with them, and they, they are two, you negotiate with them about your tariff. And there are two categories of tariff that are important to us. We call the bond tariff and the applied tariff. Tariff is a tax. It's a nice word for customs tax. The bond tariff is the highest tax that you could charge on anything, like pork, lettuce, cars, shoes, etc. That number was arrived at from negotiation. The, the, the highest tariff, cost insurance freight that you can charge. And then the applied tariff is the one that you actually charge. So, for example, if, if a country decides that they potentially, when a car comes in to the country, or when tomatoes come into the country, you could, the highest tax you could charge is 80% of the cost insurance and freight. That's the bound tariff. But if the country decide that, you know what, I'm not going to charge 80%, I'm going to charge 12% for its own reasons, that's the applied tariff. The general principle is that our countries have high bound tariffs on agricultural imports, but we apply low tariffs. My proposal in 2019 is for us to increase our bound tariff. It, what it does, it stimulates local production. It gives you greater market access. What we're doing is something which is legal, which the WTO has already agreed to. When Mr. Sean comes to make his presentation, he will give you it in more detail, in a more succinct manner. I heard it because of time. Basically, as I wrap up, our theme, food security. One of the fundamental elements of food security is your own production. We are a country, a developing country. We don't have a lot of resources. We can't buy all that we need. We need to produce. Plus, we have the conditions that allow us to produce. Therefore, going forward, if we're going to seek to secure ourselves, one of the critical things must be greater production, greater market access. And we have to use the means necessary to us in terms of making water available, in terms of dealing with the things that destroy us, insect, pests, pigs, monkeys, and use the international leverages that we have if indeed we're going to secure ourselves and our people. I appreciate your patience and I thank you for listening.